What, what a wonderful introduction to this whole concept and uh, discussing the options and the needs for this field. I think that as we are approaching this, we are learning so much about what we thought we knew uh, and have learned from engineering that we really know very little. My, uh, I have no conflicts for this talk, but my conflicts are displayed here. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanisms of micro regurgitation and after the uh, uh, erudite discussion, and this will be very superficial, talk a little bit about percutaneous mitral valve clip procedures and outcomes, and then some of the new therapies that are out there. And as you've heard, the mitral valve is not a valve, it's an apparatus. And so as we just saw, every component of this is involved. And if we're thinking about how we're approaching this disease state, we've really focused on a single small piece, treating a leaflet uh, with our current interventional therapies. And as we move to new percutaneous therapies, we begin to treat annular components, but we still don't have ways percutaneously in general of treating cordy, muscle dysfunction, et cetera. The etiologies are varied, and as we've heard from a number of the discussants already in the cases that have been presented, it's both primary, secondary, as well as combined etiologies, and of course rheumatic and endocarditis are important, but not necessarily part of our percutaneous therapies. So if I can, very simplistically, let me summarize the difference between treating the aortic valve and treating the mitral valve. We pretty much have a single knob that we use as we're treating the uh, aortic valve. And as you just saw, uh, as we begin to think about therapies, multiple therapies are really required for the mitral valve. We all are aware that mitral valve increases mortality. We saw a recent example of that as well. And simply the presence of mild or moderate regurgitation from this uh, Bursi article that is uh, now widely quoted, demonstrates in the setting of coronary disease that the accompanying mitral regurgitation conveys a, a important difference. As Dr. Lowry discussed with us, there are a number of techniques out there that have been used that look at a variety of different approaches. I will say that as opposed to his approach, not everybody is as uh, active, aggressive, or able uh, in terms of the therapies. And if you look at uh, Vesalia's uh, uh, long-term outcome by age, by repair, repair is done not as commonly in other centers. So you send a patient for a procedure, and I will say that in many centers, and as shown here, about a third get a repair, as opposed to 90-some percent, as, as happens here. Uh, and those do have important outcomes. And it is different by age, and the mortality in many centers varies by age as well. So that the older individuals have an increase in mortality. They have uh, a higher likelihood of replacement by age as well. And if you look at their overall expected outcomes, mitral valve replacement conveys a worse prognosis than repair. Now I will say that this is true when we look at randomized trials. Barbanti's shown us that, from ta that if we look at TAVR, the implication of mitral regurgitation, particularly in the SAVR group and this higher risk group, partner A, uh, had differences in outcomes as well. So mitral regurgitation in the setting of TAVR and SAVR continue to have prognostic implications as well. So treating the mitral valve, I think we all agree, is something that needs to occur. Uh, the original concept is attributed to Otelio Alfieri. We just heard that referenced as well. And, looked at a large series of repairs that he did after noting an anatomic variation in which there was fusion of the anterior and posterior leaflets. And, uh, and in this group, there is benefit in that population. We all recognize, again, that that's not benefit necessarily from an isolated treatment. And so that's an important thing for us to convey. However, the adaptation of that was, of course, uh, the idea of using this clip that we have seen so elegantly demonstrated yesterday that is allowed to be transeptally placed and then to capture the uh, leaflets and oppose the leaflets. This is not the same thing as a, as a simple stitch. It does capture the leaflets, does tether the leaflets, and conveys from a uh, uh, physiologic standpoint a different uh, approach but it is something that has uh, now shown us that it can be done in a select group of patients. So what does that select group of patients look like? Well, traditionally, it was a very small number of patients that had these kinds of characteristics, primarily A2P2, primarily a coaptation length that was more than two millimeters, a specific depth, a flail gap less than 10, flail width less than 15, an orifice greater than four, we'll come back to that because that's something to pay attention to, and leaflet length, and as 
we have gotten more exposure to this commercially, these areas have been expanded upon. So can you approach the A3, P3 area? Can you have larger flail gaps? And by pacing, can you approach those patients? But these are the standard criteria that were utilized and, and have been used in the so-called MitraClip system. This is the approved FDA device in the United States today for uh, degenerative valves, and it's based upon a large series of studies and a relatively small number of patients. So from the feasibility trial through a randomized trial with continued access to a high-risk cohort, uh, we've looked at that. It is true that if we look at the clinical outcomes, that these patients do pretty well when selected for this trial. Highly selected group of patients, and if you look at the five-year outcomes, freedom from death, whether you had mitral clip or surgery, whether you had uh, the look at the need for reoperation, there is a significant difference in mitral regurgitation, and we heard that referred to as well, and New York heart classification uh, improvement clinically. So the clinical outcomes are similar. The mitral regurgitation is not the same. And here again, if you look at mitral clip, uh, from degenerative or functional and look at five-year data, surgery clearly has less regurgitation than the MitraClip itself. And so if we think about what we've learned, at least from this randomized trial, that MitraClip was safer, lower length of stay, a higher discharge directly to home as those early periods of time, it was more, surgery, however, is more effective. Both improved the physiologic events, ventricular remodeling, clinical events, heart failure class and quality of life, and in this group, it's been suggested that it might be targeted to a higher surgical risk patient. And of course, it was released for that higher surgical risk group of patients. In heart failure, there is evidence that by treating these patients that you can diminish the overall risk of rehospitalization. And that spawned a number of trials, the MitraClip trials, including COAP trial, which is close to being finished in the US. Where's Paul? Um, I, I think we're within a couple of months, I think is what the current uh, idea is. 430 patients, 75 uh, centers. A large body of work in these patients because it takes a lot to get them through the standard medical treatment uh, and, and be approved for the trial, but I think it's gonna set a great tone. It's being looked at in Europe in the Reshape 2, and then there's the Mitra FR trial in France as well, answering much of the same questions. MitraClip has been widely adopted. We saw as it has been expanded what's occurring. So we have from Everest to realism and now over 30,000 uh, patients worldwide have benefited from that. And you saw a reference to Paul Saraj's work in which he's looked at now the TVT registry. Um, and I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the uh, data that's come out of that. You can see clip implantations, 97% success rate. We heard a question about the numbers of clips. It still is over half that are getting a single clip, about 40% are getting two clips, and a small number of patients are getting more than three clips. And the mitral regurgitation, self-reported, we heard a reference to our need for having uh, improved standards on that, uh, significantly improved from grade three and grade four. However, 60% of patients still are, are defined as grade one, and uh, uh, another, uh, 30% at grade two. So that is one of the things that's being followed in terms of outcomes. The procedure itself is safe. The number of events that are, have occurred are small. Device embolization is vanishingly small. Single leaflet detachment has been minimized with the changes that occur. Uh, and the need for other therapies such as and, uh, urgent therapy like acute <coughs> cardiac surgery is uh, diminished. I will say that the issue of ASD closure is one that is topical because uh, increasingly people are closing the atrial septal defect after these procedures and may be a subject of some discussion as well. I think what we are seeing is that there's a better understanding of when we may have a good outcome. Here is uh, the recent publication from Lubbock, uh, Lufkin, excuse me, that looked at what identifies when the clip may fail and looking at uh, the EROA, the mitral valve orifice area, and the, the uh, mitral pressure gradient all give us important information, and there was some discussion of that in the case yesterday, particularly if you look at the mitral valve orifice area. So if it's greater than three, you're likely not to have significant stenosis or, or failure of the event. If you have a gradient that's uh, more than four, 
uh, you're more likely to have uh, an aborted procedure as well or clip failure. So knowing those numbers is important as you're beginning to select these patients. Well, not surprisingly, it's not simply the degenerative valve that is being approached with this. There are increasing numbers of reports of individuals that are looking at failure of surgical rings and clipping in that situation as well. Uh, small cases such as uh, uh, Grasso's re uh, report looking at that uh, has uh, demonstrated that in highly selected cases that uh, the same kind of technique can be used even in degenerated rings uh, such as a Cosgrove ring here. All things, however, are not the clip. Uh, there are things on the horizon, and that's really, I think, where this technology is leading us. And, and the collaboration between the cardiothoracic surgeon and the cardiologist, I think, is in this expectant arena of where the new transcatheter mitral valve areas uh, uh, treatments are. And you can see that this whole cosmic event is out there and really mirrors what I just showed you in terms of the numbers of buttons that get pushed within mitral valve therapies. And they include edge-to-edge, -edge, which we just talked about, direct annuloplasty, uh, uh, along with ventriculoplasty, coronary sinus therapies. The mitral valve replacement approaches uh, remains one of the hottest areas, and then a number of other approaches. And I'm going to highlight just a few of those in the remaining couple of minutes and talk about what's been seen and what we know and then some of the limitations. Coronary sinus approach, the, the farthest along is the Carillion device uh, in the so-called Amadeus trial. It's uh, designed to be implanted in the coronary sinus. It's affixed with these rings uh, that you can see at the end, and these are designed to, over time, because they are night null to constrict down. Uh, the advantages are it's pretty easy. Uh, the disadvantages are that so far it's only had modest MR reduction, and it really does put the left circumflex artery at risk. In the Titan trial, uh, the reduction occurs. It occurs over a relatively longer period of time. You can see here that it's over a period of months and it continues uh, to decrease the regurgitant volume. And so it's not something in which you have an acute reduction and often uh, may take enough time where it would be more of an adjunctive technology. Direct annuloplasty includes the mitral line or bident approach, the GDS or Accusinch and the Valtec cardioband. Uh, all of these are in various stages of evaluation or uh, uh, sputtering evaluation. The concept, again, is to look at the annulus, not at the leaflets and not at the sinus itself. Uh, the mitral line has been evaluated in a CE mark tr uh, trial with a very small number of patients. And as you can see here, patients felt better. The MR grade reduction was, was, uh, uh, de was significant as well, although there were significant numbers of patients who had residual uh, MR in that. The Valtec Cardioband, uh, transeptal access with a, a superannular implant that's TEE guided. You can see again here that it's designed to, to approach the ring and may give more of a pliable uh, or uh, uh, malleable ring than is seen in others. Uh, MR grade in this small group of patients, again, uh, shows uh, uh, reductions at discharge one month and, and sustained reductions in a small number of patients, with 91% of the MR, again, being graded as less than two at six months in a non-core lab environment. Uh, and that corresponds to functional improvement, both at baseline and at six months, uh, with improved walk tests, as well as uh, uh, improved uh, New York Heart Association uh, clinical uh, status. The millipede is a transcatheter annular reduction device, self-centering, self-positioning, uh, that's designed again to expand the ring into the mitral valve as an annular stabilization. MVRX has a percutaneous septal shortening. This is uh, really, the idea is uh, to come and uh, go transeptal. It's, it's a direct AP diameter shortening. It's designed for functional therapy. Uh, it provides uh, essentially interventional steps that most of us are used to doing from a coronary sinus to an atrial septum approach. It's relatively small at 12 French. And proof of concept shows reduction, again, in small numbers of patients of the grade of mitral regurgitation from three down to about one and a half. Again, not complete resolution. If we move down the heart, talk about chordal structures, neocord. Uh, is a way of uh, percutaneously, transapically addressing that. Uh, and the, uh, the idea is here that you can apply new cords uh, using a, a suture-based uh, uh, approach as well through the transapical approach. 
Well, all that sounds good, but the uh, approach that everybody's most excited about, of course, is transcatheter mitral valve replacement. It's most commonly done as either transeptal or transapical. Uh, all are currently self-expanding. All are in various phases of trials, some of which are being actively investigated, and this is not the entire list, but simply some examples of that uh, from the uh, uh, Tendine tiara, uh, uh, the, the uh, Edwards cardiac, uh, uh, and uh, the direct flow uh, mitral valve. The approaches, again, are primarily transapical uh, and are performed in a way that's not too dissimilar from transapical aortic valve procedures. Uh, the idea behind these, again, is uh, various forms of anchoring within the valve, and you can see here uh, from the Abbott Tendine approach uh, in an animal model. And then if you look at the valve as it's been implanted here by ECHO, you can see the uh, new valve implanted across. I will say one of the problems that, are, that uh, is facing all of these is that these are uh, valves that have, uh, first of all, they're transapical primarily. And secondly, if you look at the orientation of the valve, one of the, the important issues I think we have to resolve, and we heard reference to that, is how this interacts uh, with the left ventricular outflow tract, how it seats itself in the ventricle, and, and many of these seem not to be centered in a way that, that, that assists the flow and emptying of the left atrium. And so impediments of that, uh, the fact that these valves remain very high up inside of the left atrium seems to predispose to the formation of thrombus. So TMVR is not TAVR in another position. The mitral valve annulus is clearly more complex in 3D structure without the fibrous calcified support with the uh, aortic valve, and the pressure difference is much greater uh, than the LVAO. Transapical access is still cardiac surgery. Uh, if you look at how patients do, uh, I'm told by our surgeons that the quote of the most painful procedure that they perform is a transapical <laughs> procedure. Perhaps we can get them to confirm that much more than others. Valve thrombosis is an issue and I think remains one of the major limitations for the trans, uh, uh, these early stages of these transcatheter valves. LVOT obstruction because of valve orientation or leaflet uh, manipulation uh, is an issue, uh, particularly in the degenerative valves and small ventricles. Perivalvular MR is, is uh, something that needs greater appreciation. Uh, LA embolization. Uh, is uh, important and has not been resolved. And of course, circumflex uh, coronary sinus compression uh, is uh, uh, w something that requires better assessment. An injury of structures, left atrium, and closure of the left atrial or the left ventricular apex is important as well. So, mitral clip therapy is FDA approved for symptomatic patients uh, who are poor surgical candidates and is currently uh, uh, now being. Uh, widely practiced in the United States, including here, as we saw yesterday, for these patients with symptomatic secondary MR. Uh, we'd remind folks that COAP trial is available, and you should be looking to enroll those patients so that we can answer this very important question. Newer devices have potential, but are a long way off. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We've already seen several of these devices fall off of the cliff in terms of development and approaches. And although uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement may be the future, mitral clip therapy, I think, has a role and will continue to have a role in our approach percutaneously to these high-risk patients. So thank you very much for your attention. This